All right, welcome back everyone to part two of this training on NASA Atmospheric Composition Ground Network supporting air quality and climate applications. Today we're going to continue with Aeronet and do some hands-on analysis of data. Again, I'm Dr. Carl Mallings and again joined by Dr. Pawan Gupta, one of the Aeronet co-leads. And today we're also joined by Peter Gugorov, a scientific programmer from Science Systems and Applications Inc. here at Goddard who supports the Aeronet program. In this part, we'll be showing you how to access relevant Aeronet data for given locations and different application purposes in a variety of different ways, and also showing you how to compare and jointly analyze the Aeronet data together with relevant satellite aerosol optical depth data products from the VIRS instrument for a given location and time. Just as a review, last uh, session we learned about Aeronet. It's a passive remote sensing instrument measuring aerosol, optical, microphysical, and radiative properties from more than 600 active sites around the world, giving total column aerosol information. And if you have any questions during this training, please put them in the questions box in the WebEx tool, and we'll address them at the end of the webinar and also uh, in a document which we will post to the training webpage uh, after the training today. And now let's hand it over to Dr. Pawan Gupta to talk about hands-on analysis of Aeronet. Okay, great. Uh, welcome back everyone to the part two of this webinar series. Thanks to Carl for introduction and uh, continuing this series into part two. So in part one, we learned a lot about Aeronet network how it make measurements, what kind of instrument we make, what, uh, what kind of uh, different geophysical parameters on atmospheric aerosols are produced by Aeronet and how international community comes together to run this great network, which has been providing data for last 30 years. In part two, what we are going to do is, we're going to start looking some of the Aeronet data using some of the online tools which we have in-house through Aeronet. Uh, we will also go over specific websites, show you, uh, walk you through with some of the tools. Uh, and I would also recommend everyone to uh, have a uh, internet web browser open so that they can actually walk through with me. And I will, in between, I will also ask people to do a small exercise as we move on towards the uh, this part too. So let me quickly start with uh, some of the slide deck which we have created as a reference slide for this. Uh, this part of the part two of the presentation will not use uh, the part two of the presentation will not use a lot of the slides but we will do online uh, demo and online uh, walkthrough to the different tools. But I want to actually just go over this slide deck which we have prepared as a reference slide. When I say reference slide, it means if you have something missed during the demo, if you want to come back later on and take a link or refer uh, what particular part of the website or tool is doing what, then you can come back and look at this slide. So this can serve you a reference slide later on time. Uh, this is just the list of things which we are going to do today. Uh, we'll have data display, data download. Uh, we'll play with some of the Jupyter Notebook uh, Python codes to uh, visualize Aeronet data into different, uh, uh, different ways. Quickly, this is the main page of Aeronet website. Again, we are highlighting and I will walk you through actually different component as we go. Again, showing where the data part is located on the Aeronet website. Again, a great reference slide. This is how the data station data looks like. Um, I will show you how to access this particular uh, file. Uh, this is a site information page, how it looks like. Again, we'll walk through this and go over it when in the live demo. This is the data display page. Uh, again, it shows very quickly what to look for, but uh, when we do the demo, we'll walk you through and understand each of these plots more carefully. This is the data download page, uh, how to download the data. This is a data synergy tool, Aeronet data synergy tool. Here we actually try to 
bring Aronet data along with some of other satellite data, uh, real-time imageries, some model output to look them together to understand specific atmospheric phenomena or atmospheric aerosol properties. This is a very new in-working uh, tool uh, called mapping uh, through API, uh, where we can actually map the aerosol data uh, from Aeronet from all around the world uh, on a map. Uh, more recently, Aeronet data has been actually incorporated uh, into NASA Worldview tool. Anyone who is using satellite data for any of the application, uh, they are familiar with the NASA Worldview tool. It's one of the most popular tool to visualize uh, near real-time satellite data. And Aeronet has been just added to that. Uh, these are a little bit more on data API, people who are more data savvy, if they want to access the data in more automated ways, API is the way to go. And this is the part where the we have some uh, Jupyter Notebook in Python, which we have put out on GitHub. Uh, they perform different operation, and my colleague uh, Peter uh, will actually go over this part. Uh, some example what we can do using those Jupyter Python codes. Uh, so you, you can do the map in different projections. You can do the time series. You can do some kind of a tile plot showing over different time of the window. You can do some trend analysis, uh, simple or uh, using annual mean numbers, uh, calendar plots. So we have uh, several Python codes which do these tasks. And finally, uh, Aronet data, how we actually co-locate in a space and time with satellite data. In this case, uh, we have an example code uh, which does this for the VS data, which will show and demonstrate uh, using the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, these are some specific details, how to connect with our code and uh, so on and so on. We have also included a couple of slides uh, to guide you to through to get some of the aerosol data from satellite because in our last code we used the satellite data so we just want to make sure people are aware of satellite data although we assume anybody who is comparing aeronet and satellite data already have good understanding where to get the satellite data again on the satellite data a specific part okay so i think that's all those slides are and before I move on to the actual uh, demo, let me take a pause for a, um, for a few seconds, uh, 10 seconds, so that people can uh, get into their browser and uh, get ready to walk along with me. Okay, great. So before we start on the web demos, um, let's find the Aronet site. So it's easy to remember the Aeronet website. It's aeronet.gsfc.nasa.gov. But if you cannot, uh, the best way to do is just search Aeronet NASA in the Google search engine or any other search engine you like and hit, and the first one will come up as Aerosol Robotic Network homepage. And if I click on that, you will reach to this page. Now let's me make this a little bit bigger in terms of font so that everybody is able to visualize, vis see that more clearly. So when you go to this website, this is our home page. On the top, we have different components of Aeronet, which we talked about in part one. Uh, this gives you a little bit introduction about Aeronet. Again, we talked about this all in part one and describe what different component does. Uh, this is the map showing all the stations. And if you come on the bottom here, we update this particular section in, with the news and announcement. So for example, NASA Aeronet data was recently added to the worldview, which I talked earlier, uh, is a news item here. We have some specific about uh, maintenance issues for people who are using data on a regular basis. We have a big meeting coming up in September, so that announcement is here. We have a newsletter, so that announcement. So anything, sometimes we also put out some quick analysis on interesting 
aerosol events which are happening. So this is from the last year when Canadian wildfire actually happened and a lot of smoke was transporting here in the East Coast in the US. We put together how Aeronet is actually measuring those smoke uh, aerosols in the atmosphere and how it is impacting their quality in the Eastern Coast. So there's a lot which we put here time to time. So anybody who's really looking for this Aeronet data, watch out this space for new and updates information. One more thing I want to point out, uh, we have a list uh, So on homepage, you can see this yellow highlighted part. So if you are interested in receiving regular uh, updates about Aeronet and any uh, specific things through Aeronet, uh, you can click on that link and join uh, uh, Aeronet listserv and you will get in regular updates uh, from Aeronet team. On the left, you will see different parts, right? So you have networks, campaign, collaborators, data, logistics, all different things are there listed here, okay? So I will go over some of these uh, more de detail, but let me uh, go through the homepage first. This section is where the Aeronet data section, so anybody who's interested in accessing data or displaying data, this is the section to watch the panel, vertical panel on the left side, where you have visualization tool. We have the data display, download in different ways. Uh, and these are divided into different types of data sets, which we talked in part one. So these are direct sun measurement, aerosol optical depth. These are inversion data product like single scattering albedo and other things. Uh, we have some other things also like solar flux. These are the ocean color data, which we talked about, Aeronet OC. These are the nighttime data using the lunar. And then we have some other cloud mode, which we have not talked in more great detail, but these are some experimental data sets. Okay, so before we move on, let me show you one of the thing which often people use, specifically people who have used a lot of data sets. So one, what is recalled is site list, okay? So if you click on the text format, then you will get a list like this. And this list combines all the sites Aeronet ever has created. So it has site name, the first one, and then the longitude and then latitude and then the elevation in meters. So this site is generated, I think every day uh, and it is get updated. So there are, if you look counts, I think there are 1600 some odd number of sites which ever created. So this is this can be a good source for people who want to analyze global data sets. The site list is also available in Google Earth format. So if you want to download that and display in Google Earth, you will see all those uh, dots all over the world. And if you click on the all list, you can get that the same list in Google Earth format or text format by year. So you can generate this list by any years. So let's click on uh, 2024 and then you will get a list like this. This list is very similar to what we saw earlier, but in addition to those station information, it also has information in terms of data availability. So the, the way data availability is displayed, we have done in one way. So for each month, we have set up the flag one or zero. So if there is a data available for that particular month, it is saying one. If there's no data available, then it is says zero. So there is a, this flags for each month is available. And this again can be very useful for people who wants to analyze or understand how much data is available from particular site on particular year. Again, there are so many lists here uh, people can browse through. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, homepage after browsing those lists. Now, first thing I want to go over is called what we call site information. So again, on the left side panel, if you click on the site information page, you will reach to this page. Now you will see a notice here that if you want to stabilize a new Aeronet site, 
if anyone is interested in getting a new Aeronet site near them, uh, they can contact us uh, and we can see if Aeronet. Just remember, um, every we cannot fulfill every single request. There are so many factors which determines where we will put the Aeronet station. So, uh, but this is a way to uh, start the process, whether it is possible or not. Now we have a similar map as we saw on homepage. This map is very uh, interactive. You can zoom in, zoom out any parts of the world. Uh, there are four buttons on the top. Uh, by default, all the stations are displayed, but you can also display active stations. So remember in part one, we talked about that although there are 17, 1800 stations dis deployed during entire time window of Aeronet, but the currently about 600 stations are active. So out of all, if I just click active, then these are the sites which are active in last one year. The sites which we, the, the way we define the active sites are sites which have produced any data in last 365 days. That's the site we call it active. Then there are inactive sites which have not produced any data in last one year. And then there are some sites which are limited. So these limited sites are created sometime to test the instrument or to make measurement for just for a few days. Uh, sometime they can be very specific to field campaign or something, but they are very, very rare. Uh, limited sites, I think we define them uh, if the data is available for less than 10 days, then we don't call them permanent or campaign site. They comes into the limited site page. So the most important one is the active site page. Now, on the bottom of this map, you will see a list of all the sites, okay? And as you start zooming into the map, you will notice that that station list also start reducing. It only shows the list which is displaying on the map. So I'm going to go to the NASA Goddard area. That's where we are located. That's from where we are doing this webinar series. So I'm going to, I have already clicked all the active sites. So this is the area where we are located. And if I go down to the map, then you will see there are only nine stations which are displaying in the map which we have. And this particular site is the one where we are located. It's called GSFC. There are two sites actually on the so same location. One is called GSFC, which is the oldest one. And more recently, we started a GSFC Polar, which is a polar instrument uh, on the Goddard site. So I, if I click on the GSFC, you get to this page. Let me zoom out a little bit so that we can see what is the on the page. You have site name, you have coordinates and the elevation, same information as we saw earlier in the file list. Here is the picture. Typically we have two, three pictures. So this is our Aeronet since it is a calibration center. Uh, we have uh, mounted many, many instrument here for calibration purpose, which get swap out on a daily basis. There is some site description. There are some information about if you want to contact the PI site manager, there are some information here. So for each site, we have this information. So let's go back to the map here. Now, as exercise, I want you to take two minutes of your time and zoom into the area where you are physically located and find a site which is nearest to your location and note down the name in piece of pen and paper or on a uh, notepad on your computer. And that is site we will use throughout this uh, rest of the uh, presentation to actually evaluate or download the data. So I'm giving two minutes time for everyone to look, browse through this map, find the site which is closest to you and note down the name. Thank you.
Okay, great. So I hope everyone uh, with internet connection, uh, you have uh, ability and you have explored the site information page and find the nearest internet site, which is close to you. Okay, now let's move on and just remember that site name and we'll use it later on. Now, let me also go through some of the other pages on this website. Uh, we have a, a link which is says campaigns. So again, I talked about this in part one, Aeronet supports several NASA and non-NASA field campaigns specifically designed to make aerosol measurements sometime for air quality applications, some for time to do the climate applications, some time to understand more atmospheric uh, behavior of atmospheric aerosols in chemistry and um, energy budget. So these measurement Aeronet uh, has been taking to support this field campaign since beginning of the program, as you can see in 1993. And since then it has participated in many, many uh, field campaign. Uh, starting 2011, we started deploying this high density network called Dragon. Uh, the most recent one we deployed uh, Aeronet is in the Asia AQ. So I'll just give you a flavor of how this campaign information looks on our web page. So once you click on this campaign page, you will get to that. You will have some background information about the campaign itself. And then uh, we will display and provide the near real time data to actually not only people who are doing the campaign on the ground, but to the community as well. And this data helps them to actually do flight planning. If they're flying aircrafts, uh, they can actually uh, change uh, their uh, flight plans uh, based on where the aerosol events are happening based on their own data, which becomes almost in real time available. So again, during Asia AQ, we deployed in South Korea, Philippines, Taiwan, and Thailand. Uh, these are the locations specifically actually done just for the field campaign. There are additional sites which you don't see here, which are permanent sites uh, in that particular regions of the world. So this is just example here from the same page. You can download the data also. Uh, you can also get the list of uh, location list here. Uh, there's a map where the new sites are displayed in blue color. The permanent sites are displayed in green color, very similar to what we saw earlier. And if I just click on the campaign, then you will just see the blue color sites, which are specifically uh, falls in the, and then there are some more details, contact information. Like. So very important, if you are interested in field campaign data sets, uh, this is the uh, Aeronet contribution to those uh, campaigns. Okay, now let me go to the operation. Operations is a specific page not, may not be so much useful for the data users, but this is more for site managers and principal investigator of each site. People who actually manage the instrument on remote locations at universities or institutions or remote or, uh, individual houses, this is for them. And what this does is it provides a lot of information about the health of the instrument. So if I click on, for example, instrument status, let me click. These are the different Aeronet networks, partner networks. As remember, we talked about that Aeronet is a network of networks. So these are the different networks. So if I just click on the Aeronet, then you will see all the instruments which are actually deployed and you, you'll see many, many stations, many, many with the GSFC because these are all deployed for calibration purposes. So you will see a lot of specific details about those instrument. Again, not so much useful for the data users, but for more for site managers and PI. Okay, uh, now one of the most important uh, thing is about the system description. We talked about very briefly in part one, what kind of measurements uh, sun photometer or what kind of instrument Aeronet use, uh, here you will get a lot more details about that. Uh, 
So you can click on the measurement system and you will learn about all that CML instrument, what each number in that name means, different wavelength combinations, all the specific things, including the communication. Um, in the calibration section, you will read about uh, entire calibration process, which I have briefly gone through in part one. But if you are interested in more details, you will get a lot of details here. There is a operation page. Uh, there is a data transfer page. You will get a lot of details, specifics. Uh, if you're transferring data through GSM or internet or satellite, uh, we have a data processing process set up, how the data are processed, we get the data and then it gets through the different and then finally the data distribution, which I will go over a little bit more. Okay, so that is what system description takes you. Now, let me take you to one more important topic is logistics. Again, this is not so much for data users, but this is for people who manage those site. Uh, but it has a lot of inf important information. So we have all the manuals of all the different models of sun photometer, which we ever used. We have several videos to troubleshoot the instrument, to install the instrument. So these are very uh, instructional videos. Uh, we have some tools, uh, how, to trans how to actually do some data transfer. Uh, we have some, we do a lot of shipping, as I mentioned earlier in the part one, the system has to come every 12 to 18 months to NASA Goddard or any other calibration center. So there's a lot of shipping happens back and forth uh, from the site to uh, one of the calibration centers. So there's a lot of information here. Uh, again, not, not so much useful for the data users, but for the site managers and PI. Okay, one more thing, publication. Uh, since the beginning of program, there have been a lot of uh, uh, research article which uh, are published by Aeronet team and Aeronet partners all around, from all around the world. And we have tried to archive them here. Most of them you can directly get to the link. Some of them are very old one and you can actually find through the search. We also have links to the quarterly newsletters. Uh, we also uh, have several reports uh, on Aeronet, uh, different data sets, some details uh, about a specific version, a specific products. There's a lot of uh, reading material available for people who wants to use the Aeronet data. Okay, so this is main parts I have gone through. There are some other things which you can go over in your own. They're very, uh, clearly written there. Now, I also want to show quickly about ocean color, which we talked about, Aeronet OC in part one. Uh, this is a specific page on that. They have their own news, uh, although it's component of Aeronet, but it operates only over ocean, their sites, their data downloads, all the details are there about Aeronet OC. Similarly, we have for maritime aerosols, which I discussed earlier, uh, using handheld microtops. Uh, this is a uh, old paper, but it described the uh, main network very clearly. Uh, we provide the data sets here. Again, all the data sets are produced here and they are named based on the ship cruise and time window when it happens. And you can download this data actually. So you will see a long list of ship crews from where we collect the data and the data are reported here. Okay, so I think that kind of completes the first part. Now I want to get into the data part. So I don't need data access, right? So let's start with alpha optical depth because that is the most common parameters used um, from Aronet. So the first one is called data display. I will click on the data display and it will take me to this page. So on the data display, now again, this map is there. You can actually filter this map in many different ways. How many years of data are available? What level of data you want? 
Uh, you can also pick individual years, you can pick month, day, you can pick active and inactive sites, all kind of things you can do here, right? I'm going to just look the GSFC site and then what you can do is when you're walking through with me, you can select the site which you identify earlier as the nearest site to your location. So instead of GSFC, you can pick that site. Yeah, so I'll just, so I pick the GSFC site. I click on that. The map shows the location of the site. And then when I click on the GSFC, it will take me to the data display page for the GSFC site. So once you click on the GSFC site, you will come here. The page look like this, okay? Now let me walk you through very quickly. So again, this is the site information page link, which we saw earlier. Here are some details about the people who manage the site. Here are some statistics on the data availability. So, from this particular site, we have 25 years of data record. It started in 1992, 93, 92, 93, and uh, currently data is. So the total number of days are these, almost 30 years of the data are available from this particular site. Data are arranged in different years. You can select any years. Uh, these are the parameter which you want to display. You can select, I have selected the aerosol optical depth first. And these are the different levels. Again, level one is the cloud raw data without cloud clearing. Level 1.5 are cloud clear, automatically cloud clear data. And level two are quality assured and calibration applied. So the, for on quantity purposes, we recommend that users use level two data. You can display daily averages or all points. Um, so let me go to level 1.5 data because that is available in real time. Okay, level two data takes one to two years. And this is 2024, August, and today is August 2nd, All right? So this is showing the August one and August two data and then this is just for the August 2nd. These are the time in uh, UTC. So you can see these different lines shows the aerosol optical depth corresponding to different wavelength which are represented here. AOD at around 500 nanometer is 0.344, which is actually pretty high for this location. So there is a uh, wildfire going on in the West Coast, which may have some influence transported, but also uh, during summertime, sometime it can be high uh, because of the hygroscopic uh, effect on aerosols. On the bottom, you have several links. You can download the data directly from here, uh, or there are other ways to download, which I will show you. So this is what the first visualization looks like. Now, let me go to the download tool next. The interface is very similar, okay? You can select any site. So since I am going directly to GSFC, on the search box, I'll click, put GSFC, click on the GSFC, and then we'll take. Once I click on the station, it will take me to the download page, and you can see various options here, okay? You can select the date range. So I'm going to just select 2024, for a sample download from January to December 2024. And then there are different types of measurement which you can download, which we talked earlier, and you can get. Now, what you can do here is you can click on this data description page and you will get description of all the things which are written there, how the daily averages are calculated, how the monthly data are calculated, what it means, for different parameters, all the raw data and inversion and everything. So very specific and details informations are actually provided on this page. The unit page gives you the units of all the parameters which we provide. So you have a specific units for each of those uh, parameters which we provide. So just for sake of uh, demo, I'm going to choose 
level 1.5, uh, aerosol optical depth, precipitation water, and then angstrom parameter. And then I will choose all points, means all the measurements which are taken, and then the daily average is just the daily average. So to keep things faster, I will choose daily average, level 1.5, January 1st to December 31st, 2024, and click on the data download. Once I click on the data download, you will get to this page, which is basically Aeronet data policy. So since Aeronet is a collaboration uh, among many countries, many individuals, uh, we try to make sure that people who manage the individual sites uh, uh, get credit when their data is used for publication for research purpose. And that's what exactly this data policy page shows, how to refer the data before you use the data and research and publishing uh, do you want to give some credit to the people who are managing and collecting the data uh, uh, from that particular station believe me it takes a lot of efforts to maintain these instruments they often get uh, problems and the site managers have to continuously watch for them and make sure the data continuity remains so that is the whole purpose of this data policy page uh, you click accept and then you immediately it downloads the file it's the files are downloaded in this form this is the uh, initial date and this is the ending date of the data and the site name and level 1.5 so these are downloaded as ascii file uh, i can open this using excel or text i will just open in the text here just to show you how it looks but you can also these are basically CSV files, so you can easily open them in a Excel spreadsheet. This is the header of the file. You will see all the details about the data sets, different columns. So you will notice there are many, many different columns presented here. Uh, but this provides you everything you need to use the data for various scientific research or application purposes. So it's very simple format, very easy to use data and very easy to download the data. Okay, now let's say you want to download all the global data for the entire time frame, everything together, then we have this as well. This is called download all the data, all the sites, all timestamps. And they are provided in two different format. One is star.gz and then just, just the zip format. So depending on your requirement, you can uh, download any of these. Uh, they are again separated by all points data, daily average or monthly average. And again, these are different uh, parameters. These are SDA, aerosol optical depth, whatever you need. And again, users guides are also given here. So this is another way to download. The, it's a huge file. When you click on the download, you will get a several gigabyte of files. So it's it's a little bit bigger file, but you get everything into single file. Climatological tables. Now this is another piece of information which we provide. Again, very similar interface uh, as you see earlier. What it does is it provides climatological values for each site. Again, this is the data policy. I'll just say accept and then you get to these tables. So what these tables provides you are the climatological mean for each month and year. So this is entire time window for each month, how the aerosol optical depth is. And this is yearly mean 0.18. And then this is one standard deviation. This is angstrom exponent. This is standard deviation in angstrom exponent. This is precipitable water vapor. This is standard deviation in water vapor these are the number of days which are used to average get this value and these are the number of months for which uh, annual data are average so this is for the entire time window but you can also get into each year this is 1993 and remember whenever we don't have the data we don't provide it we don't try to fill it so if any of the month is missing yearly means are not calculated. User can calculate their own annual mean, but we don't provide it here. 
and you can download the data using these uh, files which we have here overall download combined download so this climatology is very very useful they are calculated with a lot of precaution quality control and people who are interested in trend analysis uh, they can actually get this quantities easily okay uh, so now the next thing i want to do is click on the web services so on the web service we have uh, data access through api again different types of the data we are going to look into the aod and sda these are different parameters and their explanations in the api okay and in the bottom these are the different examples how the apis are called so let's say i want to get level 2 level 1.5 data from all sites available from the aod right or i want to get level 1 data uh, for one of the site so let's click on this particular link this is a web link which you can actually uh, define so instead of what i will do is to get the data for the Goddard site, I will change in the web link site equal to card site instead of card site. My site name is GSFC. And you can change to the site name which you have noted down earlier. So once I change the site name, I rerun, and that's what now the site is GSFC, and this is for 2000 data. Now instead of 2000, I'm going to and get the data for 2024 so this is 2024 and then now this aod 10 is level one so i'm going to change this to A aod 15 equal to one it means I'm getting the data for level 1.5. So this is level 1.5 data, uh, all the points uh, which were given for that particular. This is GSFC, this is the day, month, uh, and this is, since we are doing average equal to 20, it means it is going to give me daily average. If I do average, Equal to 10 i think this will give me all points so this gives me all point now this api is very useful people who wants to access data in more automated ways uh, we will show you some example how we use this api in python code with when we get to that part okay so i hope you are able to follow along and get up to this point let me go back to this website again so this was data display and data download part. Now, you will notice that although I have only gone through aerosol optical depth, but these similar capabilities are built for each type of data sets, which you can explore in your own time. Now, in the next few minutes, I will quickly walk you through two more tools, which we have. One is called Map Explorer. Uh, this is a I'm going to reduce this is a quickly visualize the data and it can visualize either near real time data or daily mean data. So select a mode, it's near real time. And then if I select the daily, then this day night flag should go away. And you will see, let me select from yesterday. So you can actually map the aerosol optical depth over the entire globe and let's since we know already there are have been a lot of fires in the us currently going on so i will just go back a uh, few days and let's look uh, july 26 for example uh, so this is july 6 2020, uh, 2024 you can see some of the stations let me zoom in this area they are really high aerosol optical depth in this particular part of the world. 
the gray area uh, stations shows inactive sites on that particular day and i can turn them on and off if i want if i don't want they can be turned off now if you mouse over any of these sites you will see specific details about the site it will can take you to the data page also from here but if you click on them you will get a time series of the data from last 30 days so you can see how on this particular site aerosol optical depth was so low in the earlier in the july aod values were less than 0.1 very clean condition as soon as fire started aod started jumping up up and then it reached to all the 1.24 and these are daily mean values if you look hourly values they can be much more higher so this is a nice tool to visualize the data if i do on the near real time basis then it basically takes the current time and display the data which are available in last one or two hour time window and you will also notice that this also displays a day night uh, separator so the area which are kind of hidden gray colored they are night time and this is the daytime so aeronet is an optical measurement uh, most of the our sun data are during daytime there are some night data which we don't display here but we do have night time data as well so again very nice tool uh, if you want to visualize data on the map okay now let me go to the synergy tool now so we can click go to the data visualization click on the synergy tool here uh, i won't spend a lot of time but again you can do similar things you can choose the date time site information and then you can select different things from here what you want to visualize some of them uh, may not be readily available and some of them may be available so aod inversion products right so you can display select again what parameter you want to display you can choose water vapor or angstrom parameter so you can actually decide which parameter you want to display here are the size distribution refractive index or other parameter which you want to display so for this particular date probably you don't have the data available so let me switch to level 1.5 and then here also level 1.5 then let's pick another date yeah now this is for january 14 so you can see um, some other parameters so this is refractive index this is size distribution yeah so if you click on that you will get a size distribution basically it's showing that there are two modes in january one is dominating in the smaller size particles and one in the coarser size particles and depending on time of the years this size mode can change so let's look at the size mode just now what is happening during the fires and we have some impact of fires right so size distribution now you can see a little bit different now dominating mode is the fine mode smaller size particles whereas the coarse mode is not that much of domination so this the, this is also a good tool uh, to actually look several data sets together okay great uh, so that was uh, aeronet website tours and data download now i'm going to pass along to my colleague peter uh, he is also part of Aeronet team and he has developed some of the Python tools to visualize, map, do time series uh, and do intercomparison with the satellite data. Uh, so he will show you how to access these codes and how to run them uh, using Google Colab. So for this specifically, I'm hoping everybody has Google account. So please sign into your Google account if you have not. Uh, because we are going to use Google account to uh, do that. So, Peter, take over. Thank you, Pawan. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Peter Gregorov, and I'm Aaron's uh, new scientific programmer. 
I developed the following Google Colab codes in the infancy of my career, and we think those codes are very important because it gives people outside of our network the capability of interacting with internet data and producing some cool plots. So there are five codes that we're going to go over. The first to read and map Aeronet's aerosol data onto a global map. One of them produces a series of static plots that can be saved uh, onto your machine, while the other ones produce more interactive visuals with some widgets. Another script accomplishes a similar task, uh, except it uh, pr uh, produces, except it reads inversion, uh, Aeronet inversion data. Um, and then another script reads aerosol data once again, but it instead produces a variety of time series plots. And the final script collocates Aeronet aerosol data with the VR satellite data and then does a comparison. So the first code that we're going to open up is the read and map Aeronet data or AOD. And just note that uh, this, uh, these codes are on the Aeronet GitHub and they're open and the link to this repository is I think on slide 17. Okay, so now that we have uh, this code open, so the purpose of this uh, code is to read and map Aeronet data directly from our web API. This data includes our AOD measure, uh, measurements taken with uh, different wavelengths, as well as angstrom exponent parameters. Uh, different parameters can be specified by, uh, by the user, such as the a geographical box of uh, the coordinate box of latitude, longitude, um, the type of average, whether it's daily or hourly, um, the time frame, uh, channel, etc. And the output of this code is those geographical maps with the circle markers and color bar, which represent the average daily or hourly values of the products. The main use of this tool is to track the movement and density of aerosols over time. And this tool was first deployed in June of 2023 and mapping the aerosols produced by the Canadian wildfires. Um, and this time we focus on the time frame from July 25th to August 1st, where we would track some of the wildfires that are affecting the west coast of the US and the spreading throughout. So this module makes use of uh, certain um, uh, certain libraries. So the first thing that we will have to do once we run the script is we we'll have to mount our Google. Uh, sorry, we have to mount our Google Drive onto this Colab notebook. Otherwise, if we do not do that, we're not going to be able to, you know, save our our produced plots. So we just have to click continue. Make sure you have a Google account, as Pavan had previously mentioned. And these are some of the libraries that we make use of. Uh, the NumPy library is for array manipulation. Pandas is for um, data cleaning and data processing. Uh, some of our map features, such as coastlines, state boundaries, et cetera, are done with uh, Cartopy. And in addition to that, uh, some of the projections that we use, such as the orthographic or the plate carry projection, those are imported from the Cartopy library as well. Beautiful soup. Uh, kind of an odd name, but that one uh, is a is the most popular web scraping library from Python, where it would access a website, send the request using the request module, and then it would read that data, the text file on the website um, as a text file. And then GeoPandas is similar to Pandas, except it's for geographical data. So now that we've gone over some of the relevant libraries and we've mounted our uh, Google Drive, the next part will be the input parameters. So how the web API works is we have some parameters and those parameters such as the date, the level data, the uh, features, the coordinates, they're used to construct a URL hyperlink. And depending on those parameters, so it'll, it'll produce a different hyperlink, a different, sorry, a different URL that contains that uh, relevant data. So our initial and final dates are in four digit year, two digit month and two digit day format. Our level, uh, as Pavan mentioned, Airnet has level 1.0 data, uh, level 1.5, which is uh, cloud screen and quality assured. Then level 2.0 data is in addition to 
uh, quality assured in cloud screen, it's also um, calibration uh, verified. The average type, um, so we have three types of averages here. Either we can produce daily plots, which is the average for the day. We can produce by hourly bin, or the time average is the total average for the entire selected data frame, or the data time frame, which will produce only one plot. Um, these two variables, vis-min and vis-max, they are the color, color bar bounds. So we've defined the AOD value greater than 1.0 is going to show as a magenta on the color map. Anything less than zero will show up as gray or, or unavailable. And anything in between will, will follow this color pattern where for low AODs will be uh, dark green, for high AODs it will be dark red, and then anything in between. So, um, so after defining this color bar, uh, our final, some of our final um, parameters for data aggregation will be selecting our feature and our channels. So, if you would like to select a AOD or an Angstrom exponent, we either do one or two. Otherwise, uh, um, and then after that is done, we select um, our specific channel. Uh, so we have dozens of different wavelengths, but the most popular uh, AOD that almost always has data is the 500 nanometer. And then here's the bounding box. So uh, they have to be in a decimal format because the uh, web API does only take a, de um, a decimal format when constructing the links. So we can run that. And um, and since everyone can download a copy of uh, this this code, they, they they're free to do so, and and everyone can change their parameters as they as they wish. This next cell, uh, what it does is it validates some of the data, uh, and then and it prepares that those inputs for constructing the link. So first, um, this block here takes the initial and final dates, and extracts their year, month, and day components. Here uh, in this block, we take the user input of the level data and we convert it to an integer number. So if it's level 1.0, it will become 10. If it's level 1.5, it will become 15. And the purpose of that is the web API reads it uh, in, in such a way. And then the same thing, some the, some data verification for VisMin and VisMax, make sure none of them are negative, make sure they're not flipped. And then this is the last verification check, which prevents users from selecting a the current year and level 2.0 data, because as Pavan earlier mentioned, it takes a couple of months, maybe up to a year for level 2.0 data to show up. And after that is done, we construct the URL, as is seen here from all of the input parameters. And then we pass this URL onto this request module, which sends the HTTP uh, request using the web and uses the beautiful soup package to convert that to a text file that is saved. So that is, uh, after that is being saved, it will the file would show up onto your uh, uh, Google Drive. So once that is done, we read that text file and we assign it to a pandas data frame. So data frame is kind of like, um, uh, it resembles an Excel file, it has column. And then uh, this is where the, some of the data manipulation begins because our, our date and time uh, format for error and data, they're a little different than, uh, than the conventional ones. So this block of code basically converts them to Python's date time format, which follows a four digit year dash two digit month dash two digit day. For Aranet data, it's using um, two digit day uh, colon two digit month colon four digit year. And then, depending on the average type that we specify, we group them based on the Aranet site and date. If it's daily, if it's hourly, it's site, date, and hour. And if it's uh, for total average, we just group everything by the site. And the numeric columns argument pretty much uh, makes sure that string columns do not get, get aggregated, otherwise they will cause uh, an error because we cannot average 
non-numeric columns. And then there's a check here that if, for example, if um, our data frame is is does not exist, or if there is no data, it will print a message that there's no data to parse, and then it will prompt the user to retry with different parameters. So now we have some data. So the next, uh, after we have our data processed, it's time to select the data that we want to work with. So this uh, this cell, this particular cell, does exactly that. It extracts the, all the AOD columns and the, uh, it, sorry, it reads all the AOD columns or the actual exponent columns. And then it matches the proper columns based on the user input. So depending on if your feature choice is AOD or if your feature choice is angstrom or um, what um, AOD value you use, it parses through the file and it matches your input with the proper file. And at the end, it isolates the data frame to just include the site latitude, site longitude, and the um, AOD column or the actual exponent column. After that is done, we produce a, uh, we, first it's very important to drop all values that are um, undefined and to reset the index. So what resetting the index does, remember we group by area site and date for daily averages. To do further manipulation, we have to reset the index so we can include the site and date back into our data set. So now we have data set that is ready for plotting. So here we make use of uh, all of those uh, plotting packages such as CAR2P and matplotlib. And then we produce those plots for each day. So now, um, the code should generate a plot for the first day, which is uh, July 25th, and then it will keep loading until it goes to um, the last date, which is August 2nd. So here we have um, for J July 25th, you can see some high AOD values in the Midwest, and here's some some forest fires on the on the uh, on the western side of the U.S. around Idaho and Montana. And some more for that day. And here's on the 28, they're spreading to uh, the North Great Plains. Same for the 29th and 30th. And here's where um, they're kind of like subdued and they've already pushed, they've moved a little eastward. You can see some higher AOD values around the Great Lakes region. And now here, um, the AODs are, uh, AOD values are pretty much uh, stable. So that was for the plate carry projection and a similar thing can be done except in the orthographic projection, uh, which some people may um, prefer because it gives you the, the it's, it's like, you know, looking at a globe instead of just a map, right? So uh, the computational expense is a little greater for, for this type of a projection. So it will take a little longer for the plots to produce, but should still not take that um, big of time. So this is, I'll have to zoom out a little bit so everyone can see. So we have for the 27th. eight, 29th, 30th, 31st. And after uh, this code finishes running, everyone has the opportunity to uh, decide if they want to save all of these files, all of these files that have been produced here, would like to download as a zip file or not. So I'll say yes. So they will compress, compress them. Could have chosen a more creative name, but feel free to modify the code and, and put a different different name for the output, and I'll just put in my downloads folder, and it's going to be there. And let's see. Okay, so uh, that is the end of the read and map Airnet code. So now um, we will go back and and launch a I'll launch a different one.
So let's try the uh, the more interactive code for reading and mapping your the data. So the only difference between the this interactive code and the previous code is that this one makes use of um, widgets from the from Python's IPy widgets library, as well as Matplotlib's animation uh, package. So um, it's the same procedure as always. We define the um, same input parameters. We produce the, the link the exact same way. Um, we process the data in the exact same way. And as well as uh, um, the angstrom exponent AOD selections. The only difference is that uh, in terms of the plotting. At the end, we get uh, this map, which it's one plot, but it works like an image carousel where you select a slider, let's put the 30th. There's gonna be a, a few second delay depending on how big the data is, but that will go directly to the specified date. And similarly, this is done for the orthographic uh, projection. It's a uh, and again, if you uh, if you define uh, hourly average, then actually will produce two sliders: one for date and one for hour. But for demonstration purposes, we're only going to stick to date. So our plots have been produced, and we can select. Let's say 28. And the and here's the plot. And the second piece of uh, interactive widget that I decided to use here is uh, an animation. Similar to a, 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 a GIF, except um, there's some uh, control buttons, such as uh, pause, play, uh, we can either run it to, to go through once, or we can just we can loop it, and we can also adjust the speed of you know how 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 fast the um, images switch. Or we could also go in reverse. I think reflect was yes, reflect is where you would go in reverse. Yeah. And then same thing for the orthographic uh, pr projection. And uh, there is no, uh, I did not put in the script to um, uh, save these. Uh, I think uh, this inter interactive code is better for just the purpose of displaying and viewing uh, the data, which is why I did not put um, anything to save it. But yeah, this uh, this will work the same way. Okay, so moving on to one of the more recent developments. Sorry, uh, the more recent developments. It is the this script, which reads and maps inversion products. So this is no longer AOD. This um, runs uh, it plots some inversion products like single scattering, uh, uh, albedo, or. Um, like a single scattering albedo or AOD coincident inputs or extinction and absorptions, et cetera. And, this, and we can select our inversion type, whether it's alma counter or hybrid. And we can specify again our wavelength of interest. And similarly, like before, uh, there's some data validation and uh, constriction of the, of the data year month, or uh, sorry, constriction of the um, converting the timestamp to individual year, month, and day, constructing the hyperlink, and then reading it through beautiful soup. And so here I combined all the data processing and plotting into one big cell. So it should start plotting some of them. So uh, this particular this script, just because I combined everything in one cell, it would take uh, a few minutes to run, maybe between three and four. But at the end, it would uh, produce uh, it would produce everything for you. Uh, so we have for each hourly bin. I guess this is why it took a little long this time because instead of daily averages, I did hourly averages for each day. So, 
there it is. You can see some. Uh, so this plus the single scattering albedo at 440 nanometers each hour. And I think it also does it for the orthographic projection eventually. But you can just take one plot tab and you can uh, see in detail. So yeah, this uh, this script runs same very similar fashion the way that uh, uh, the read the original read and map Aranet aerosol data works, uh, except there's some more data validation, and um, and I've combined all of the cells and uh, together. So uh, the next uh, script we're going to run will be for the read and map Aeronet time series. So we can just close out of that. Uh, can go back to our Google Colab. Okay, so now that everybody has that open. So the purpose of this script is to read AirNet data again from the awareness API and plot time series graph to visualize changes in uh, AOD or angstrom exponent parameters. Except this time it does not do it for the whole, um, you know, the the whole uh, geographical domain. It does it for the specific AirNet site. Um, so again, we can specify, you know, site name, uh, average type, data level, wavelength, time frame. And it produces three plots. It will produce a, um, a, a standard um, time series graph. It will produce a standard time series graph. Um, it will also uh, produce some uh, calendar plot, uh, a tile plot, and at the end it will, it will, it will produce a, um, an annual variability plot with some uh, standard deviations. Um, over superimpose on the graph as a, a shaded region, right? So we pretty much use almost the same uh, packages. Uh, we have Cal, uh, except yeah, CalPlot is another package that we have to install. That one's different from uh, the previous one. All the other ones are are pre-installed already. We have Math for. Um, some more complex equations. We have uh, some other matplotlib uh, components like m dates, which converts a date time to numeric. And then again, we have to or drive onto this collab notebook. Just click continue. So obviously the only difference with the input parameters is that um, we also have to specify site name and actually the web an Aranus web API, you can put uh, the site as a parameter and it will generate a link with data just for that specific site. So in this case, we choose uh, NASA Goddard, which is GSFC, and we're doing it for a period of 10 years. So starting, yeah. So averages, we can either choose uh, daily or monthly. Uh, so uh, daily averages is preferable here because you're also gonna get the calendar plots and the tile plots. And unfortunately you cannot produce a calendar plot with, with monthly averages because the purpose of a calendar plot is to show the value for um, each day. So now we read our, our URL, same data validation as before. Uh, same uh, um, same data processing and same feature selection. And at the end, for our specific site, notice that the area site name is no longer there because now it's, it's redundant because we're doing that for uh, each specific site. So you have the date, day of the year, and the AOD measurement. Day of the year is uh, important to have here because uh, because date is it's it's an object it's not a 
an integer value. So it's going to be difficult to manipulate whenever we're doing um, counters. So the first plot is a time series graph. But depending on the average type, it will produce either a monthly average or daily average. A little clutter here because, um, again, it's a daily average, so it's valid for each date, and this is over the course of 10 years. So, but we can spot some uh, seasonality here with some of the um, peaks. And obviously here we know this is uh, during the uh, period where there was a lot of wildfires in uh, Northeast Canada. So that's that was roughly, yeah, it looks like that's around summer of 2023. And this is where we produce our tile map. So tile map is, let me zoom out a little bit. It, it resembles a tile, basically. Uh, the months are on the uh, y -ax uh, x axis, sorry, and the years are on the y axis. You can actually specify a monthly average, except for the month of January, instead of having 30 values, we'll have one value. So it's just going to look like a less cluttered tile plot. You can spot specific days where the AOD might be higher. And this calendar plot is for, again, for daily averages only. Uh, it would not reproduce if the average type is not one. It's not daily. So we wait for it to uh, uh, produce. And it looks like it is done. So uh, I cannot zoom out far enough to see the whole thing because it's a very large data frame. But here it is, uh, side GSFC. And not only does it show uh, the month and the year, it also shows the day of the week. Here that gives us a more clear view. We can spot particular days where the AOD will be really high. And then once, and again, we can see for the month of June, the wildfire season, we can see some, some of those particularly um, high AOD days. And finally is the annual variability plot, which again, can only be shown for daily averages. So what it does is it aggregates the data it shows for a particular year what the average AOD was at that site, and it creates a linear a regression line along with a standard deviation. And we can see the, the long-term trend of AODs, and we can see that for the Goddard site, it's been, the average has been pretty uh, 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 consistent. But if we generate some plots for um, other places where, uh, where recently the, uh, the governments have uh, have um, have, have implemented some measures to reduce the level of pollution, you can see that the trends have gone down over the years. So again, this last part will um, prompt the uh, user if they want to save those plots to a zip folder. In this case, I would not want to save it. And so this is it for the time series script. So, uh, now we can transition to our final script, which is the one that collocates Aeronet data with Veer's data. Let's wait a little bit for everyone. Uh, open this one up. Okay, so this is this code. I would say is probably the most involved in terms of what the user has to do okay um so first we obviously want to install the, some of the libraries here um, and while that runs i can explain uh what this code does so uh, after mounting the google drive just to continue continue yeah so um this code includes uh so yeah it collocates airnet data with veers data Include some functions for spatial averaging and statistical comparison. It retrieves and processes Ovir's aerosol data uh, from the uh, NASA's LADS uh, query, uh, data query. And it also retrieves and processes Airness aerosol data in a similar manner uh, using the, the web scraping uh, capabilities from, from the web API. But the catch is Ovir's has, Ovir's, uh, uses the 550 nanometer channel, which Aaron does not have. 
So for proper comparison, we do um, some statistical interpolation using the 440, 500, and 675 channels to infer what the AOD measurement would be at the 550 nanometer channel. And I think we use a cubic spline uh, in interpolation. And yep, it's a cubic spline, correct. And after the collocation is done, we, we produce um, two outputs. One is a, an Excel spreadsheet with the collocated data. And the final one is a um, visual, a collocation plot. So uh, we use a 5.5 pixel um, grid to get those, to obtain those spatial averages. And this is the statistical, statistical function which where we uh, compare the actual and then the predicted values. And when we, we obtain some uh, values, uh, some uh, metrics such as the bias, uh, root mean squared error and the percent error. So uh, the setting up pass and directory, uh, this script, um, uh, what, what this script does is, uh, so in our case, we made it a little, a little easier. We have put our query file, our last query file into our um, GitHub. So now we can just read the file directly from the GitHub. And uh, what that file contains is a URL, a link to every all the NetCDF files in our query. So in this case, we chose uh, July 15th through July 31st, and we focused on the region of South and Southeast Asia. Uh, so that's all the AOD 550 nanometer measurements. It then constructs uh, the file name. Uh, it, it sets up some of the working directories. And this is this URL is the one where um, those measurements are taken uh, are um, are obtained from. So uh, running this code is more involved as it requires our data credentials and the ability to use the NASA LADS archive to query cloud and air. website, the user will need to generate a token, uh, which serves as authentication to download and access that data. That token is unique for each user and it expires every 60 days. And that token is actually specified right here after the uh, bearer attribute. So, once logged in in our data, the token can be generated by clicking the generate token menu, um, which which uh, Pavan had had uh, went over, and we insert it in in line six here. Sorry, not line six. Uh, that this is cell six. So, um, so in this cell, we download and process this uh, VIRS data. So the data set is being um, read. Uh, we calculate the moving averages. Uh, we uh, we obtain the latitude and longitude. We format the date and time, and at, and at the end we we concat all the data sets together because again uh, this does this produces one data set per um, per hour or per I think it's per hour correct so. Um, so depending on um, the length of, of the daylight, there could be up maybe anywhere between eight and 14 files per, per day. And each of these uh, NetCDF files are saved in your local drive, my drive, and we can see our set workshop, and we can see the, uh, the R A A A ARDT query. We have all those VIRS files indeed saved for that time frame. So now we're done with downloading and processing VIRS data. Now the next step would be to download and process AirNet data in a very similar fashion, right? So we can choose minimax AOD. So we only chose standard AOD between zero and one, uh, not too high AOD. We specify our coordinates in a similar way. Now make sure that the boundaries, the coordinates that you use in your LADS data resemble the coordinates that you're using when querying the AirNet data, because otherwise, at the end, um, the code will crash because there will not be any data to um, to uh, co-locate. 
So now after processing the error and data, this is where the collocation happens. The collocation is uh, we use the cubic spline to um, where we interpolate the 550 uh, nanometer uh, value based on the three channels, the 440, 500, and 675. This section of the code will take the longest time because uh, because uh, it uses some uh, not complex but computationally consuming um, um, arithmetics. And after this code is done, it saves the collocated data as a CSV file, which is also going to be found in your uh, working directory, and that can be downloaded from your uh, uh, Google Drive. And uh, if you if you'll notice, you don't have to specify date here, because uh, why you don't specify date for the, uh, for AirNet? Because uh, it takes the dates that is produced, the, the dates from the VIRS data set, it assigns them to a list, it's called date time, and then that list is then uh, being fed in a loop, right? The loop is called date, uh, a date time, where each index of the date time um, list is used to access the URL and then uh, download that ARNET data. So in this case, we're not producing one URL with, from AirNet. We're using it multiple times, as many as their unique date times in the VIRS dataset. So after the um, Excel file is is, um, is produced, there's going to be a, um, the final section of of this code, which is which is plotting. So to plot it, uh, we isolate. Um, the necessary columns, uh, and and we we filter the values uh, based on uh, uh, AOD. It produces the following visual. Let me zoom out. So we have the uh, uh, measured VIRS AOD at 550 and the interpolated ARNET AOD at 550. The solid so the solid line represents. Um, the line of best fit and the dashed line represents what theoretically the line should be if there's perfect collocation between AirNet and VIRS data. So our R is uh, 0.851. So R squared will be will be means, means probably roughly around 0.65 or 0.7, which means that the um, collocation is, is fairly uh, reliable and uh, deterministic. The samples are 93, which means that there's 93 sites that this interpolation has been, uh, this, this collocation, sorry, has been done for. So yeah, um, more details on how to uh, run the script, like how to uh, set up your account, how to query LADS, um, and how to authorize um, the LADS applications on your account, and how to generate a token can be found on the VIRS AirNet Comparison README file, which is once again on the AirNet GitHub. So um, thank you everybody for um, uh, running these scripts with me. I hope you enjoy them and I hope they're not uh, too uh, complicated. And now back over to Pavan for the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Peter, very much for excellent uh, overview of the Python codes. Again, uh, if anybody has trouble in running up those codes, please contact Peter's. All the links, his contact and details are there on the GitHub and on those individual codes. And we will be happy to help uh, if anybody has trouble in accessing or running those codes. So, Quickly, I want to summarize uh, all the things which we have covered today. Uh, again, Aeronet is a network of ground-based sun photometer. Uh, it makes aerosol measurements uh, from around 600 active stations from all around the world. It's not surface measurement, but it's a total column measurements of the atmospheres. The data has been 
around for last 30 years, extensively used in air quality, air pollution, climate change research, uh, to validate the satellite, to validate the model outputs. Um, in this particular uh, part two, we have actually gone through uh, different parts of Aeronet websites, uh, which include interactive site maps, data visualization in many, many different ways, and then most importantly, data download, which is free for everyone to download and access in simple to use ASCII format. We have Bave API also for super data users, uh, people who want to automate and display that data into their own system. Uh, APIs does that very cleverly and easily for everyone. Uh, and then Peter finally covered some of the Python tools uh, which are available through the Aeronet GitHub uh, page for uh, to move to download and analyze the data uh, along with the satellite data in more uh, quantitative analysis. And then finally, again, I think uh, as uh, I mentioned uh, in the part one, Aeronet is a collaborative efforts international community actually contribute to all the Aeronet data, which are we distributing. So I really acknowledge every single person directly or indirectly involved in Aeronet, either site managers, PIs from all over the world and the uh, various uh, network teams from uh, partner networks, including uh, NASA Goddard team, who actually works very hard to make this data available for the community. So, yeah, I think that's all from me. Uh, I thank you, RC team, for organizing this. I want to hand over back to Carl uh, to continue from here. All right, thank you very much, Pawan, and thank you, Peter, for that uh, overview of how to access Aeronet data. Looking forward to the next part of this training, we'll be learning about Pandora, which is another ground-based passive remote sensor which actually provides complementary information to the aerosol network, uh, the Aeronet network rather, on trace gases like ozone and nitrogen dioxide in the atmosphere. Just as a reminder, the homework for this will be posted at the end of our last session, which will be August 22nd, and you'll have about two weeks to complete that homework assignment before the deadline. Here's our contact information uh, if you want to contact us. And again, there's an Aeronet mailing list you can register for if you're interested in using Aeronet data. And here's a, a summary of some of the links that we showed you to the different resources. So thank you very much for your attention today, and we'll now move into the question and answer session. And because we're um, over our scheduled time, uh, we're going to try to go through some of the high priority questions that are really focused on uh, the tools and the data sets we talked about in the training. Um, so I think we're going to start off um, a little bit lower. Again, we'll we'll cover these and these answers will all be posted to the website after the training, but because of time, we'll just focus on a few questions. So first, we'll start with question six. Um, which is in the Aeronet downloading tool, what is the meaning of the, the different levels? Uh, so the, and what are the implications of using the different AOD levels? Um, this was, I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, Carl. Uh, so I think we discussed this in part one, but just mm -hmm. I think it's nice to rephrase that. So we have three levels of data, level one, level 1 1.5, and level two. Uh, level two are the highest quality of the data, which are done after the post fill calibration. And we recommend that for using for scientific research analysis. Uh, level one are basically raw data without any cloud clearing. Uh, so we don't recommend those data unless uh, you're looking for uh, some other piece of information. Level 1.5 data are very similar to level two data in many ways, except it does not have the post fill calibration. Uh, so, for many application, uh, people who need the data in real time, they can also use level 1.5. Uh, uh, but for quantitative scientific research analytics analysis, we always recommend using level 2 data. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think our next uh, question that we prioritized was question 15 here. 
Um, so on the tool, and specifically they were referring, I think, to the Data Explorer map tool showing the, the near real-time data on a map. Uh, what is the time being used? Is it GMT or is it local time in the, the time selection? Yes, so the way the tool work is all the time, first of all, in all of our data sets are expressed in GMT or UTC because we want to make sure that it is consistent globally. Uh, you can always convert that time into your local time using either standard or sun time. Now, on the map tool, what happens is it reads, uh, if you have, if you're displaying the near real time data on that tool, it reads the time from your computer. So it reads the local time from your computer and will gather the data from past one hour or one to two hour exactly and then display the data there so although the the it is reading your local time from your computer the data is still displayed in uh, gmt time it just gathering the local time information to and to make sure that you get the time data closest to what you're looking for okay great thank you um the next question related to tools was 18 which is um, how do we adapt or port the Google Colab example notebooks into Jupyter Hub? Um, what kind of modifications might be needed there? So uh, I don't think you need to modify anything as long as uh, you have all the dependence packages. Uh, you can download uh, the data files directly either .py or .ipnvy, um, and you should be able to upload to any uh, Jupyter Hub on either on your local computer or uh, some online uh, hub. Uh, so I, I don't think you need, to, there is any changes you need to make. Only thing you will have to be careful about is, uh, in often in the code, uh, there are directories uh, and paths, file paths are defined where you're reading either data or you're saving data to output. So those paths have to be changed depending on where you are running. Currently, those paths are defined while considering that everybody is running on Google Colab, but if you're running on some other um, uh, hub, then you will have to adjust those paths according to your local settings. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is how do how are missing data or or not a number of data values handled? Um, both here specifically, and maybe I'll generalize the question to uh, if you're taking a long term average of AOD, for example, uh, what fraction of missing data are there recommendations about what fraction of missing data is acceptable versus what should be filtered out? Yeah, so call that is a very philosophical question in mm -hmm. many ways. Uh, yeah, because it really depends on your application uh, mm -hmm. the tolerance level of missing data, right? Uh, if I'm looking for a day to day change uh, within a month, uh, then I would like to have data on every single day. Uh, if I'm looking for dynal cycle, then I would like to have data almost every hours or even finer time scale. If I'm looking for long-term trends, um, then I think having majority of the months of the data for a given year is recommended because then you don't miss certain types of aerosol optical depth values. Like let's say you're looking over uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, in God, where the Goddard is located, and if you're looking for long-term trend and if you're consistently missing aerosol optical depth values during months of June, July, where the values are highest, then your trend will be actually biased towards the low AOD values. So I think that missing, how much missing can be there uh, or what is recommendation, I would say more the data better you have the chance of getting accurate results or trends or radiative forcing calculations or how the changes are happening in the atmosphere. Uh, uh, miss, more the missing data, you have more uncertainties in your analysis and your outcomes uh, will be more uncertain in that sense. And like I said in the beginning, it really depends on specific applications. So you, you will have to make that judgment yourself. Yeah. Okay. Um... 
the next one is maybe another philosophical question, but so if you're looking at uh, an AOD time series, this is question 22, um, and you see an unexpected single day spike, which you can't easily explain by knowing, for example, that there was a wildfire nearby on that day, what would be some of the next steps or the next tools that you'd recommend to I, try to identify what the source might be? Yeah, I, I think that's again great question. So uh, there, there can be many things happens, right? So if you see a sudden spikes, first of all, you want to see how long that spike sustained, right? If it is just one single measurement and then there was nothing before or after, uh, then it it could be a cloud contamination. One of the suspect suspect. It could also be a very uh, you know, fine. Um, air mass, a small part of the air mass, which is passing over the location, which probably is not explained by big event. It could be a small uh, dust uh, gust or something which passed by. Uh, sometimes some people, uh, and we have seen this, sometime um, there's aeronet station and some people are smoking next to the station for a few minutes mm -hmm. it can create an spike easily um, but from the data perspective i think what you can look is uh, uh, aeronet provides the data in many different wavelengths so i think if you're seeing a spike in one wavelength uh, i would also recommend to check in other wavelengths is it consistent in that in other wavelengths or not that can give you an indicator whether it is real or it is an artifact um, and I think uh, the the suspect will be, I would say, the cloud contamination could be a problem. And typically, Aeronet data are very well cloud masked, uh, except for the thin cirrus clouds. So if there is a thin cirrus, mm -hmm. um, then we may miss that sometime. We, although we do them also very cleverly clear them, but we have noticed sometime uh, that we may have some serious contamination in our data. Okay, great. Um, so the question th 23 rather is, is it necessary to modify the URL to download the lunar or the nighttime uh, Aeronet data? In other words, maybe are the nighttime data also accessible through the same API as the, the regular daytime data? Yes, so if you look, all the APIs are very similar in nature, uh, mm. and there are different flags um, or keywords in in a way in which you can uh, define in the API. And um, I think there is a keyword which specify whether you want daytime data or nighttime data. Uh, the And therefore, we have a separate API for nighttime data. Uh, it is specifically designed to get the nighttime data but i'm sh i think there is also a way to get both day and nighttime data using same api call i don't mm -hmm. remember the specific at this moment but i i'm sure in the examples uh, on the api page there are examples which shows you how to get both data together mm -hmm. okay uh great so this is um that was the the main questions that are the most relevant to what we covered today. Um, again, we'll go back and we'll post this to the training web page in the next week, probably um, once we've gone through and we've we've written down answers to all to all the other questions as well. Um, unless Pawan, you want to rev uh, rev revisit one of the questions now. Sure. So let me, I think I, I read through the question. So a few things okay. I want to just make a com, uh, a generic note here, okay. which kind of covers some of the question, but also people have questions. So a lot of people have asked about uh, if they are interested in a new site or if they want to re uh, revise a an existing site, which is not working. So I think those are very uh, logistic type of question and what uh, I would recommend, please email me on those uh, separately uh, specifying which site you are looking for my email address is there um, because each site is unique uh, each site has its own story and depending on what you're looking for we can uh, coordinate and work with you and see what best 
uh, solution we can provide. So that's one thing and that applies to the new site also. If you think um, in your region, you don't have any Aeronet site and you or your institution is billing to support an Aeronet site, um, please contact us and we will work with you to see, uh, explore that possibility. Like I said in the presentation also, it's just not possible to fulfill that globally because it in involves um, commitment uh, of a lot of resources. So, but we are open to the suggestion and we are willing to work with anyone who wants to stabilize sites in any parts of the world. Uh, it, it will just take a discussion and um, uh, at different level. So please feel free to email us, uh, email me on any new site request. Okay, yeah, that's a good a good point. Um, all right, so we're we're a little bit after uh, the allotted time, but I think we had we did have a, a lot of nice questions, so we did want to answer at least some of them live. Um, and again, everything else will be answered in this document, which will be posted to the training website uh, in about a week uh, after we've had a chance to go through and, and finalize all the answers. So thank you, uh, everyone, for attending. Uh, thank you very much to Pawan and Peter for presenting today. And we look forward to seeing you uh, two days from now for part three of the training session. Thanks, Carl, and thanks, everyone, for attending. This is great.